Um, and we're going to talk about bug mining, or industrial bug mining, aka fuzzing. So the reason we uh, call it bug mining is it turns out to be one of the few analogies I've come across in security which is actually worthwhile. Um, and the reason we call it industrial is because these days finding bugs is something that has a commercial return. Uh, it used to be you'd find bugs for fun or whatever the hell, but now that the markets are much more defined, um, it's they're getting closer to you can put a value on certain grades of root type, like even if it's not a confirmed exploitable bug. So to do it for money, you want to do it like the mining companies do. Okay, You start with large-scale extraction. Running your one fuzzer on your one laptop uh, does not cut it these days. After large-scale extraction, you get left with masses and masses and masses of crashes. Um, I work mainly on Word. It's a strange perversion I have. Um, and we'll see some numbers later about the numbers of crashes or bugs or exception events I've got. Um, but it's a lot. So then you have to move into grading, where you need to work out, OK, on which of these bugs do I spend some time? Um, when you're on attack, as in when you're trying to commercialize bugs for some kind of return, um, you have the problem where you need to work out which bugs are useful, which bugs are going to be exploitable. Because a non-exploitable bug is useful to Microsoft, but is not useful really to anyone else. Um, when you're on defense, it's a, like you have the luxury of just being able to fix them all, right? So that's uh, the grading phase. And then I'll talk about some ideas I've had for enrichment, um, which is to take non-exploited bugs, um, just crashes effectively, um, but to give people more information. Like when we pass them over to someone that exploits, to like exploit guy, to give him a bit more of a head start so that he can hopefully get an exploit done faster. Because the less time exploit guy spends exploiting this bug, the more time he's going to spend exploiting the next one, which again increases your total return. And then phase four and five I'm not going to talk about in this talk, um, but obviously those are the natural corollary of doing it as an industry. Like something happens and then there's some kind of profit. So let's talk first about uh, extraction, which is fuzzing but fast. So now I talk about mega tests. Um, that's going to fall off. So in 2009, we built a distributed fuzzing farm. Um, we used eight servers, eight physical boxes. That's 64 cores. Um, and so I took my initial fuzzer that I wrote on my laptop, which does about 30, 45 tests per minute. And I scaled up to 30 tests a second, which at the time I thought was pretty badass. Um, like, I was happy with it. So then in like April or so, um, Tom and the office guys build this like DFF, Distributed Fuzzing Framework, which is an amazingly like imaginative name, by the way. Um, and they got up to 12 million iterations in a weekend, which is like uh, six mega tests a day. Um, but now it's faster. Now it's more like 10 unless it's faster again, no, say 10 um, mega tests per day. So I got pissy because, you know, like I released some numbers and then they released better ones. So we stripped the whole thing down, rebuilt all the software, optimized everything. And now we're doing about a tick over one mega test per hour. Um, that's one million tests, file fuzzing tests per hour, which is, you know, for me kind of fast. Like I'd like to, be, like to go faster. But that's, that's what we can do with the current hardware, um, which is what, twice as fast as, I don't know, whatever thousand machines Microsoft are using on eight old servers. Um, and it's all about scale. So what you don't have when you like write your first fuzzer on your laptop is a scale problem. And then you go and you parallelize, and you might use three or four laptops. And you still don't have a scale problem. Like, whatever parallel thing that you wrote in Twisted is like, hey, that's totally fine. It scales perfectly. Um, but when you're scaling across, say, 90 plus VMs or 90 plus fuzzbots across 64 cores, 
you suddenly start coming across all these problems that you didn't have before. You've got to look at your serialization layer. You've got to look at your distribution layer. You've got to look at the whole architecture of like, can I even ship the tests to the boxes that fast, let alone whether they can process them that fast, right? Um, and so you need to work bottleneck by bottleneck, network, IO, layer, code, until ideally what you would like to be bottlenecked on is just cycles spent on the specific code that you're trying to fuzz. So not just CPU cycles. What I would love is just cycles spent inside MSO or WWW. That would be perfect for me. So if we look at the scalability that we have with the current bug mine, the marketing guys would draw it like this. Um, the numbers don't matter, but this is the scale starting at eight cores on the left-hand side going up more or less arithmetically to 64 cores where the dotted line is. And then after the dotted line, we hit the wall. Um, but I keep going because some spare capacity is useful to soak up uh, extra tests. Like sometimes there's a test that's going to make a machine hang. So that bot is sitting there not using CPU, uh, but hung trying to allocate memory or something. So those cycles need to be soaked up by a spare bot. So as long as it stays more or less flat after the cutoff, then I'll do that. Um, so yeah, this is like the marketing version of that, of like that scalability. Woo, epic, red line, goes up. And this is how I would draw it as an engineer, um, which is a less good line. And this is the tests per second per core. And unfortunately, it goes down. Like, I would like it to be flat. Um, so. It's not perfect, but it still like tops out at over 300 tests a second, which is okay for 64 cores. But yeah, unfortunately, still not like perfect scalability, but kind of good. Okay. Can I ask a question? Sure. Hey, um, so when you're like, when you're popping up work, for example, right, you're fuzzing it, isn't there some like waste of time when work comes up and you give it a file or something? Or how are, how are you dealing with like the five second delay? Or if you're using virtual with magic no I'll, I'll, I'll talk I'll talk about that um, it is an excellent question the question if you didn't hear it was like why aren't you wasting like seconds with like just opening up the word interface uh, and I'm not um, but we'll talk about it so what do we do um, how did we build it In initially I built on ESXi uh, which turned out to be for me not such a good idea like it's free and it's worth every cent the performance of ESXi is kind of good but the management is a complete pain in the ass so we moved over to KVM um, which is just running on real Linux and we're comfortable with Linux like we've used it before we can monitor it we can manage it and it's almost as fast like I haven't done benchmarking because it's very difficult to know what to benchmark when you benchmark ESX versus KVM but anecdotally, I've never seen an XP box boot up as fast as the VMs do inside the KVM. So it's good. The storage, we moved off to a dedicated storage network. So that's a separate switch. Uh, it's a managed switch. So the, the sandbox has four NICs going into that that are teamed. Um, open iSCSI, free again. Uh, we striped a bunch of SSDs. So that's like IOPS out the butt. It's like crazy, crazy fast. Uh, we ended up using Oracle OCFS cluster file system. Um, we tried the Red Hat uh, GFS or whatever the hell it's called, but it's horribly, horribly, horribly broken. I assume that they break it so that they can sell Red Hat support, but yeah, don't do GFS. I optimized the harness as much as I could, which I won't talk about. Like Ruby is already pretty slow, um, but it turns out that's not really my bottleneck. Um, uh, and you want to optimize your fuzz bots. So, there's a lot of information that I didn't put in this talk because I talked about it in 2009. So if you really want to know how to set up an optimized fuzzbot for Office, then go read those slides. Um, one thing that you might want to do is actually kill explorer.exe. That's the shell that gives you the start bar and all that crap. Um, because it turns out when you open lots and lots of files really fast for a long time, that starts to bloat and will end up taking most of your CPU and most of your RAM. And you can run quite comfortably without it. You've just got to like, bring up task manager to start new, new processes. And uh, to answer Jared's question from before, I do not open a new office process every time. 
So this is the thing that's like potentially contentious, like it's kind of cheating. So if I open the file successfully and the OLE call returns, then that's, I, I say that's good to reuse. If I try and open a file and it returns an OLE exception, which means it's popped up a dialog box that says this file is corrupt, I dismiss that dialog box and I still call that word safe to use. And I just have a 2% chance that I'll like kill it off and open a new one to stop it like, because otherwise you leave them really, really long term, the word process itself will start to bloat. Um, and once it bloats, it runs a lot slower. So the downside, I guess, like the, the um, aesthetic argument would be that, hey, if you're like, you're leaving this word process open, um, then there's gonna be some like wacky heap stuff, so you're either gonna get bugs that are gonna be hard to repro, or you might even get um, bugs that you wouldn't otherwise have got. Um, so I'm running with full page heap, which takes care of a lot of the heap AVs. Um, and say I get a bug that's hard to repro, if I can't repro it, I'll just throw it away. It's not like I don't have enough. Like this would potentially be an issue for like a QA team or for, for Microsoft where they want like, oh my God, we've got a bug we can't repro. Like something's gone wrong and we cannot make it happen again. Um, but for me, I don't call it a problem. And it's like, seriously, almost 10 times as fast uh, doing it this way. Um, which is kind of the reason I like don't jump up and down and brag too much about how much faster I am than Microsoft because I know for a fact that they don't do this. So they've got like a 10 times speed up in their pocket that they're not using. They're just waiting for me to taunt them. Um, the, some of the stuff that KVM gives you, KVM I find is awesome. So the provisioning is super easy. Because everything's on a shared iSCSI disk, we use one template. On top of that template, we use what are called, like KVM call them overlays, you, VMware people would call them linked clones. It's just a difference disk from the template. Then on top of that, we run in snapshot mode. And what snapshot mode does is take the differences from the difference disk and keep them in tempfs. And tempfs, as long as you've got RAM, is gonna be in RAM. So A, completely, completely fast as you can go. And B, as soon as you turn them off and on, you get a brand new shiny clean fuzzbot, completely defragmented, ready to go. So if, it, if ever things are going slow in a fuzz run, turn them off, turn them on, brand new and shiny. I can make template changes in minutes, whereas before in the ESX stuff, like copying stuff around out of uh, VMFS is super slow because VMFS is not meant for that. So I had like seriously like when I was copying full disks, 24 hours to reprovision a brand new fuzz template, which sucked. Uh, the management is for me easier and much more powerful. Assuming you like uh, Bash and SSH, and let me tell you, when you're VPing in from Kathmandu, you you really like Bash and SSH. You do not like VNC. So yeah, no money on software, apart from you know me and I work for beer. Um, we're using MSN, MSDN licenses for Windows, so that's like a price may not apply. And we reckon like about 30K for the hardware. So if you, like, when we get on later to the numbers, you can all start like doing the mental maths and work out how much per bug, and you'll find that the return on investment is actually fair. Um, and it looks like this. Well, it doesn't look like this. A diagram of it looks like this. <laughs> what? This is my elite graphic design, man. <laughs> so the boxes marked A uh, are producers. Um, these are logical components. The producers can physically be on the main hardware or they can be separate boxes. Uh, at the moment, I have them as separate boxes. I can have as many boxes marked A as I want, as many producers, and I can run as many actual case generators as I want. So I can run five different algorithms for case generation side by side, and they all feed into uh, this guy B, which is the fuzz server. So the gray lines sort of separate out physical components. So B, the, the fuzz bots, like the stuff in two, and C are all running physically on the same server. Um, share and cause. Um, not only that, I can, uh, well, I guess I'll talk about that later, but I can run, I can fuzz multiple products um, because the, the A guys, they tag their cases. So I can dedicate some fuzz bots to fuzzing Word and some to fuzzing PowerPoint and some to fuzzing OpenOffice or whatever the hell. So the 
A boxes delivered to the B. That does the delivery to